Um, but for those of you who I don't know, my name is Shanna. I'm one of the fourth year MedPeds residents, and I'm gonna be talking to you guys about transition of care today. To just give you a little bit of background about how we developed this topic, um, on the pediatric side of things, so I do both internal medicine and peds, and in order to graduate from the pediatric side, we actually have to do a scholarly project um, in order to graduate. And that can consist of kind of a broad array of things, so research, QI, or curriculum development. Um, for me personally, I really enjoy transition of care, whether that's just because in our own private continuity clinics, we actually face this challenge routinely versus just the physical transition that we see of our pediatric patients as they cross the street, per se, to get care over here from you guys. Um, I find that this is something that our residents really don't have a lot of education on. It's actually not built into the resident curriculum. And so myself, along with the medicine pediatrics program directors, have started to put together a curriculum for both our MedPeds residents as well as our category Oracle residents on both the internal and our pediatric side. So hopefully this is just kind of an introduction for you guys about what's coming. Um, and I, my hope for this talk is not to overwhelm you or to make you think that you don't play a big enough role. I think that's part of the problem is that our internists don't know where they need to act. Um, and I really hope to just kind of highlight for you guys the challenges that your pediatric counterparts are facing, but also what we really need from you guys to help as we transition these complex patients over to your care. Um, if at any time you have questions or you have a personal experience, please feel free to share. All right, so I'm gonna start off by talking about three different cases um, which I encountered through um, actually piloting the course back in November. Um, so to start, the first is the case of a 19-year-old um, female, and she presented just for routine well child check in our medicine pediatrics clinic. Um, she and her mother recently moved to the area from another state, so just establishing care. Um, her past medical history includes biliary atresia, which was diagnosed as a newborn, and yet despite this, she's never had a liver transplant, and that's pretty unique. Um, she also has just routine eczema and environmental allergies. Her surgical history included a Kasai procedure, so for those of you who aren't familiar, that's actually surgical removal of the, of the extracted biliary ducts, and then you take a portion of the intestine, connect it back to the liver, and almost create an extra hepatic biliary ductal system, almost bypassing everything. Um, from that, there are multiple complications, primarily esophageal varices, and so she has had hospitalizations pertaining to that several times, um, but overall, doing very well. Her medications include um, Actigal, vitamin K, Nexium, and Bactrim, just as needed for prophylactic prevention against cholangitis, another common complication in these children, um, as well as just management for her environmental allergies. Again, she has no current complaints. She says maybe just some fatigue, but mom is the one who's worried here, and you'll see that a lot on peds. It's the parents you have to worry about. So mom says that she is really worried about getting her child in to see a gastroenterologist. Now the tricky part is she wants her child seen by a pediatric gastroenterologist, but they are hesitant based on her age. However, a lot of adult GI physicians don't feel comfortable taking care of her based upon her history. And at this time, a lot of them have already had liver transplants, so you've already kind of dealt with the newborn issues. That's not her case. So mom feels very just wary about taking her to adult GI doctor. So now she's looking to you, the primary care physician, asking where she needs to go. My second case is that of a 23-year-old female established in our clinic who's coming here um, as a follow-up with her mom and friend. Um, and she has a diagnosis of CHARGE syndrome, which is just an abbreviation for um, the major defining characteristics of this disorder, including colobomal, heart defects, coenal atresia, growth retardation, um, genital and ear abnormalities. Um, so she's had ptosis of the left eye. She's had a prior VSD now resolved. She has a history of Malro, and now she has a G2 placement, and she also has chronic constipation. She also suffers from moderate to severe intellectual delay. That's why her friend was present to really act as her advocate. She spends the most time with her. Um, she also has just global developmental delay. She has scoliosis. She's largely wheelchair-bound. She also has a history of autism and self-mutilating behavior and insomnia. Her past surgical history includes cervical spinal fusion, a G2 placement, multiple tympanostomy tubes, and a TNA. And her current medications are many, most of which are pertaining to her behavioral disorder. Um, 
again, she's only recently established care, but the issue that we found with this patient is that she had multiple subspecialists that she needed to see, from ENT to general surgery to GI to a psychiatrist, and they had attempted to go to a local clinic. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Lee Specialty Clinic. That's where we send a lot of our complex patients, primarily our neurological patients. And it's really a kind of all-for-one clinic. They can get PT, OT, speech, primary care physician, all in one. Unfortunately, this family did not feel comfortable with that setting. They felt that their daughter really needed a higher level of care, which is true. She did need a lot of subspecialists. And so now they turned to us and said, well, you're our primary care doctor. Can you handle all of this? All right. And the last case is that of a 19-year-old male. He presented for just routine follow-up in an adult CF clinic. He overall denies new symptoms. However, says he was recently hospitalized for, quote, fever. He said he got some sort of IV antibiotics, doesn't really know what he had, doesn't know the diagnosis, doesn't know what he was sent home on, but says he's probably fine. Um, his past medical history is notable for CF. He has the homozygous Delta F508 mutation and then subsequent complications, as you would expect. So the pulmonary manifestations, as well as pancreatic insufficiency, osteopenia due to vitamin D deficiency, and malnutrition. His only surgical history is that of reduction of intussusception, and then his medications are those that primarily pertain to his CF. Unfortunately, when you ask him about his medications, he has no idea what he takes. He has no idea how to obtain them from the pharmacy. He doesn't know how to get refills or even if he needs them. And he says that his grandmother, who he lives with, she goes to pick them up for him, brings them back, puts them in a pillbox for him, and then he just takes them from those. So he doesn't quite know what he takes or what's right. So hopefully, though different, I hope these three cases start to highlight some of the complications, not all, of managing pediatric patients, whether they're healthy or complex, as they go into the adult field. And so primarily what you'll start to see as highlights and themes are there's often incomplete or inadequate transition of care of these patients, so things are dropped as they start to go from their pediatric to adult care provider. Um, that transition of care is not exclusive, meaning it's not just our complex patients, it's our healthy patients as well. And then overall, there's also a lot of barriers to care, and we're going to try and address each of these in turn. And so my objectives for today are to first define the term transition of care, to review the current AAP, ACP, and AAFP recommendations regarding transition of care, um, to identify our current barriers I'm going to provide you with a few resources that hopefully you guys find helpful in your internal medicine clinics. Um, and then last, just a few next steps that our MedPeds program is taking to kind of help bridge that educational gap that we're seeing within our program. So first of all, it's transition, not transfer. And I'm not huge on semantics, but I think this one is important. So most often, we characterize transition as equivalent to transfer. And it's actually the ACGME that places emphasis on uh, transfer of care amongst providers. So most often this is seen in patient handoffs, such as when you leave for the day, the night team comes on, you need to be able to demonstrate adequate ability to transfer patient care. Um, that is not applying to transition. That's not actually within the ACGME qualifications for a provider. But it's actually the process that leads up to a single event. Um, and it's multiple steps, not just a single event. So according to the Adolescent Health and Medicine um, Society, they define transition of care as the purposeful, planned movement of well adolescents and young adults with chronic physical and medical conditions from child-centered to adult-oriented healthcare systems. Yet that's pretty lengthy, and for our parents and children, they don't quite know what that means. But what we try to explain to them is that it's a process of getting ready to take on your own health care independently as an adult. And so that seems simple to us, but when you're facing an 18-year-old, they often don't know what medications they're on, how to fill them, how to even call for refills, how to call the provider if they have questions, when they need to go to the ER, or how to even access those services. And so that's what we tell our families our goal is when we're trying to transition them, is to make their children function independently and be able to take care of their own health care. Um, and overall, it's a continuum. Um, it requires extensive coordination between our pediatric primary and subspecialty services before they come to you guys. So why is it important? How does it relate to you? Um, so first of all, it's recognized that all adolescents um, deserve seamless access to a primary medical home as well as transition to an adult medical home. And this isn't new, but what we're finding is becoming more important as children with complex diseases are now living into adulthood. So 15 to 18% of youth in North America have a chronic health condition, and more than 90% of those are expected to reach age 20 of which more than half of the youth with chronic health conditions report inadequate support and services during their transition to adult health care. 
Among those um, ages 20 to 29, there's high rates of emergency care utilization, um, indicating a greater level of need for this age group. So you may have seen patients in the ER, so maybe they're frequent flyers. A lot of the times it might be your sickle cell patients who are seeking pain meds. They come in all the time. It's because they don't have an established hemophilia doctor. They don't know what to do. Um, and we actually have a sickle cell clinic on the PED side. So essentially when they come to you guys, they're almost dropped. They don't know what to do anymore. So you may see those kids a lot. Um, to add to this, um, in an article presented by the U.S. Department of Public Health and Human Services in 2014, 33% of residency programs do not provide any formal education regarding transition of care. Again, it's a greater focus um, when they say transition, they're actually referring to transfer and so physically handing off patient care, but not actually education regarding transition. So as with any system, there are a lot of flaws. Um, and that just depends, I think, on what perspective you're looking at this from. So unfortunately, the first thing I think comes from there's no universally accepted age of transfer. Um, many healthcare providers and practices you use inflexible age cutoffs to delineate service boundaries. So ultimately, this results in fragmentation of care, discontinuity, in provision of care, overall just a very vulnerable time period for this patient population. And so I'm just kind of interested, does anyone know the actual age at which patients are not accepted into the Norton Healthcare system or to be seen in the ER? What time? We generally tell them to start coming over here to see you guys. Huh? Nope. Not 24. Sorry? 18 is generally accepted. Um, you're cheating, though. You, you know Lauren. So... Um, 18 is generally accepted within the hospital system. However, that actually is different among our subspecialty. So for our oncology patients, so anyone who's within our oncology survivorship program, so they're typically monitored five years out from their malignancy, regardless of age. Whereas patients who are our complex congenital heart, so think about your hypoplasts, they'll be seen up into their 50s, and we have admitting privileges over at Norton Children. So it's widely variable. That makes it really hard for you guys to know when it's appropriate for them to be seen at the pediatric hospital versus staying with the adult system. And think if it's complicated for you, it's probably even more complicated for our, our patients. So additional flaws overall just include inadequate support and services for these patients, inadequate planning and coordination. Again, it's not just the provider. It's a lot of ancillary support as well. Um, overall, gaps in health insurance. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know of many patients who can really articulate to me what their insurance plan is or what their plan is going to be once they're no longer covered under their parents. Um, overall, just a lack of knowledge of this process makes it very difficult. Um, and then together, it just overall creates a potentially serious health-related consequences. Um, just patient disengagement, poor treatment adherence, increased hospitalization, and overall poor, poor health outcomes for these patients. Um, so as expected, each clinic approaches the process of transition of care very differently. Um, each child and family experience is different and is dependent upon their perceived barriers of care. So I'm going to kind of go through these in turn, depending on where you are in the process. So starting from the patient perspective. So it may actually be very difficult um, for patients and their families to trust a new provider. So as children age, there's a lot of different things that go on. There's a lot of change. They may see a lot of different providers, but often the constant is their primary care provider. So a lot of families and children feel almost abandonment when you tell them that, well, you're 18, you have to go somewhere else. And that can actually lead to a lot of psychological issues, especially in some of our families that are maybe a little bit more complex, or even those with intellectual and global delay who are very dependent upon that relationship. Um, additional patient barriers just overall include ineffective health literacy. Again, thinking about those patients who really don't take ownership of their own medical problems, that's going to lead to a lot of problems. Um, when a patient can't just individually manage their care, they're not going to seek out help. And then once it's gone, once you don't have someone calling them to remind them of appointments, you don't have a pharmacy reminding them to pick things up, everything just seems to fall apart. And then again, developmental and intellectual delays specifically for our population can also prolong transition of care um, and overall just kind of impede the process. We'll kind of talk through that a little bit more and how we overcome that barrier. And finally, just lack of patient follow through. I know that you guys see this too, but when your patients don't show up, it's really hard to educate them. So um, we do the best that we can. 
again, from a parent perspective, again, that feeling of abandonment um, as patients transition from their pediatric to adult care provider is also sensed from the parent perspective as well. Um, and I don't know if you guys feel this, but in adult-focused care, sometimes patients are expected to be more autonomous, and so the parents are sometimes pushed away. And when you come into the pediatric perspective, the parents are really the highlight. That's who you're listening to to give you your information, and all of a sudden it seems to make a big switch. And parents don't really like that. So they don't know their place, and so that means that your patients also don't know who or where to turn to for questions. Um, in addition, there's certainly a culture shift. So I don't know if you guys have heard, but the pediatric counterparts kind of call you guys the dark side. So we come over here and they go, oh my gosh, where have you guys been? I haven't seen you for months. Were you on the dark side? And they say it in like hushed tones. And I think part of that comes from being on the ped side where it's, you know, candy and lollipops and fresh bright paint on the walls and coloring books. And then you come here and it may not be that bright and shiny, but you still have the ancillary service. You just need to know where to look. Um, and I'll say some of our patients actually feel this way too. They don't, they're used to having that hand holding and when you take that away, they just are lost. All right, from the pediatric provider perspective. So again, several barriers are gonna exist here as well. Um, one that I think is sensed from both sides is just an inadequate amount of clinic time to really devote um, to educating our patients regarding this transition of care process. Um, there's also really overall poor reimbursement for these efforts, and so not a lot of providers are gonna take their clinic time to devote to this education. Um, additional barriers overall include just provider lack of training. Um, they don't know what services are available or even where to turn or to provide um, resources for their patients. Um, and overall, last, it's very difficult to educate our patients when they don't show up. So no-show appointments on the PED side are actually pretty difficult because then once they get to you guys, they've had no training, they don't know where to start, and then they're just stuck. Um, Kind of just reviewing a recent article highlighting the difficulties of transition of care within a primary pediatric clinic. So this was an article published in the British Medical Journal Open. Um, and it was overall just a limited study, but they were really highlighting that there's overall just limited empiric guidance currently available to guide primary care pediatrician intervention. Um, so the majority of programs are really... Um, illness specific. So if you take something like CF or CP, a lot of those are funded specifically from an organization for that illness. They're not really targeting your healthy pediatric population. So what that means is while there's really great resources for some things out there and some diseases are very well managed across the board, other things specifically within your general practice don't really get a lot of notice. And then for the adult care provider. So again, as with a pediatrician, you guys don't have time to review what should have already been done. So unfortunately, by the time they reach you, it's expected that the kids are autonomous, they know how to do things, you're now picking up the pieces, and that becomes pretty difficult because you don't have the time to do that, and you're also not getting reimbursed. Um, again, absent, incomplete records. So if we don't give you guys the information, it's really hard to expect you guys to succeed. Um, and then overall, just an unfamiliarity with pediatric um, conditions may pose a barrier to care. So um, per a reference study in 2014, about 96% of our pediatricians um, have treated a patient with CF in residency. Only 78% of internists reported similar. And within this, only 38% of pediatricians felt the same, and nearly 10% of internists felt comfortable. So although just one example kind of highlighting that Sometimes pediatric education doesn't cross, but they're still seeing things that you guys will see as adult providers. And then last, um, when there are um, a child or youth with special health care needs and they overall lack preparation to take care of their own care and be their own advocate, that becomes difficult for you guys because I don't think that's something you often have to deal with. Sometimes it's an adult who just, they hear you, they just don't take your advice, not so much a child who actually doesn't know what they're doing or how to even do what you're asking them. So in response to the need for educational reform in this area, in 2002, the AAP, ACP, and AAFP released a consensus policy statement to encourage the development of transition of care with the primary goal of providing high quality and developmentally appropriate health care as patients transfer from adolescent to adulthood. Um, and the goals were, of this report were that by the year 2010, all physicians who provide primary or subspecialty care to adolescents with special health care needs would, number one, understand the rationale behind the transition of care, number two, possess the knowledge and skills needed to facilitate this transition, and three, to just recognize when transition of care is indicated. 
Um, it overall provided a lot of guidance for healthcare professionals, including healthcare planning, information exchange, and professional education and certification. Unfortunately, in a follow-up in 2011, widespread implementation of this planning process was not seen. So they put out all these guidelines. They said, here's what you should do, and here's how you should accomplish it, and it didn't really happen. Pretty much fell through because, like I mentioned, it was a lot of great ideas, a lot of great theories. There was no algorithm behind it. There was no great planning process. Just try this, and then nobody did it. So in 2011, they really realized that their efforts had been kind of stunted. Um, so two national surveys had been released covering between 2001 to 2006, overall demonstrated that implementation of policy goals was not near where it needed to be. Um, outcomes research had thus far failed to fully address the transition needs of our adolescents with or without chronic conditions. So this was also including those specific subspecialty programs as well. So the subsequent report in 2011 aimed to further advance practice-based implementation of planning, decision-making, and documentation for youth who approach transition. Um, so in contrast to the 2002 report, they really tried to make a decision-making algorithm, and we'll go through kind of some of those steps, but really outlining very clearly for how providers can accomplish, accomplish this within their own clinic. And it included four primary steps, um, such as, and again, it's those very basic things, but encouraging patients to make their own appointments, to know how to call a provider, to know how to get refills from a pharmacy, but also instructing the provider of how to document each of those steps and how to lead a patient through each of these things. So preparing a timeline. So the clinical report um, presents an optimal age for initiating conducting, conducting transition planning, but it's really never too early, especially for some of our complex patients. They are probably already introduced to this by way of their IEPs within the school. So some of them are already familiar. Um, but the general age is recommended at 12 years of age. That's when you should at least start the conversation. Um, and follow-up should occur during well-child checks, not sick visits. Um, and then physical transfer is recommended between the ages of 18 to 21. So again, though 12 is the recommended age at which time to initiate a conversation, it's evident that developmental readiness, regardless of age, is potentially better. So what I mean by that is, for instance, if you take an intellectually challenged child and they're 12 years of age and you try to start this conversation, it's not always going to be met with appropriate um, response, either from the patient or the child, or the patient or the parent. So what we often do is we administer a readiness assessment tool to gauge their understanding and preparedness rather than by age alone. Um, there are both generic and condition-specific readiness tools, but validity, unfortunately, has not been demonstrated in all of these, and they're different across the board. Um, and again, any behavioral medical comorbidities that overall complicate the process, so for instance, you have a child who's in and out of the hospital frequently, they're sick all the time, they can't make their appointments, being able to assess their readiness becomes very difficult. And so you can take these quizzes online, they tell you, oh, you did great, I took it myself, apparently I'm an expert, because I know how to refill my meds and I know my insurance policy, but again, simple questions that for kids are not always that easy. Um, so proposed transition of care, line, care timeline is, a, is as follows. So at 12, you initiate the conversation. You let the family know that eventually you cannot always be their provider, that they are going to have to find adult care counterparts for all of their medical conditions. At 14, you start to create a formal written transition of care plan, and that just documents how the youth is going to accomplish all of these goals within your practice and how you as the provider are going to follow up on each of these things. At 16, you start to talk specifically more about office policies, have they accomplished this goal, challenging them, making sure they're almost completing their homework in a way. And then between 18 and 22, the physical transfer should occur. Um, and just something for you guys to be aware of as well, um, something that can complicate this process is guardianship. So that's something we also try and introduce to our families very early. So in each state by law, when an adolescent reaches the age of majority, the right to make legal decision is automatically conferred to the adolescent. And in most states, that, that age is 18. So the age of majority is conferred by a judge in a court of law. And as you can imagine, that process is very lengthy and drawn out. So that actually might be something that we broach with families in like the 12 to 13 year age as well, just to start that process. 
So a successful transition of care involves the entire medical team as well as the family members of the patient. It's very important to identify each family member's role and also to introduce the roles of ancillary staff. So um, on the pediatric side, we actually have a lot of care coordinators. or There are actually um, a lot of our nurses who will physically take a patient from the pediatric clinic to the adult clinic on their first visit and sit with them on their adult care provider visit. They will call them and make sure they have resources refills. They will call them and make sure their insurance has gone through when they're no longer covered by their parents. So a lot of things really go into this, and you have a lot of people that are working together. So how do we evaluate successful transition of care? So there's really no agreed upon definition of what constitutes successful transition of care. Um, and it's accepted that the process or transfer outcome really may be more condition specific. So these include medication adherence, attendance to medical appointments, uh, decreased utilization of ER and hospital resources, as well as overall patient reported quality of life. Now, the U.S. Maternal and Child Health Care Bureau currently, currently uses the following two criteria for defining successful health care transition, and those are, one, increased adolescent responsibility for their health care, and also that the adolescent be provided appropriate anticipatory guidance for the transition to adult care. Again, those are really broad. It's very hard to define those, and that's, I think, where a lot of the problem for us comes in with transition. We get these big, broad, great ideas. This is how you should measure, and this is what you should do. And there's really no measurement quality. So, so for you guys in the adult kind of population, measurement of success is something simple. You have objective data. So, for instance, good marker of good control in your diabetic patient may be their A1C. A marker of good control in a patient with high blood pressure might be that their blood pressure is now at goal. Unfortunately, when you talk about kind of these big, broad topics of transition of care, there aren't defining characteristics. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the focus is more on process, not just measurement outcomes. Um, so a lot of things that they're looking toward in the future is QI projects, um, and then also implementing things like transition clinics, transition consult services, or trained transition coordinators that would help from both ends of the spectrum. Now, there are resources out there for you guys. Um, we use this one a lot on the pediatric side. It's called Got Transition. It has a lot of things, um, both for, th for the provider, patients, and then things that are kind of on the forefront. And so this includes our readiness assessment tools, so those little quizzes that our patients can take and that we can administer within the office. It includes kind of things on the forefront, so any new legislation or any new tools that we can use. And then it also provides um, some great condition-specific uh, video resources that we can provide to our patients. So there was actually one recently on seizures, and so it detailed how a patient who was now in her early 20s had gone through the transition process from a pediatric to adult care neurologist and how she could advise children who were coming after her of really what to expect and what they could do to prepare. Um, in addition, um, the six core elements were released as part of that new consensus report, and this is really helping to fill the gap from the previous 2002 report. So it's a lot more algorithmic. It specifically details how providers can transition patients, whether they're within the, their own clinic, so such a med peds clinic or a family practice, versus physically going from a pediatrician to an a, a internist. Um, and I think that's something to highlight, is that even if the patient is staying within the own practice, there is still transition that needs to take place. And so I think that's where, as the MedPeds, we see a lot of this challenge is you see them, they're not just little Timmy anymore, they're now an adult and you need to address them as such, and there's, so there's still a process that needs to go on there. All right. Now, there are actually a lot of great condition-specific resources, so if you're ever challenged with a medically complex kid who's transferring over to you guys, don't forget to look for these and be able to refer them to the appropriate resources. Um, so Pediatric Neurology Foundation is great, as well as Pediatric Nephrology. They specifically target um, renal transplant patients. Um, we also have our um, National Hemophilia Foundation and... Um, we also have an oncology survivorship program. So any youth who's had a malignancy of any kind, again, is followed for several years within our clinic. Um, there's also CF RISE, which is a requirement and for any national CF program. In order to function, they have to have a transition of care program. So we actually have a med peds physician who works in both of these areas. So he is the pediatric um, pulmonologist as well as he works in this clinic on the adult side as well. So the, it's kind of nice for the youth to see the same physician across the board. Um, 
And then the Lee Specialty Clinic, which I mentioned at the start, is a local clinic where we send a lot of our medically complex patients to. Again, they have PT, OT, speech, as well as um, primary care providers all within one building. So it's kind of nice for your families who usually have to see four or five people within one day to just go to one place and get all of their care. And so from all of this, all the challenges that you can kind of see that we're facing across the street and that kind of then unfortunately get dumped on your doorstep when these patients come to you, we, myself and the MedPeds directors recognize that this is a good gap that we could start to fill. Um, and our goal was to create a new curriculum that is available to both our categorical and our MedPeds residents for anyone who's interested in transition of care, just wanting to know what goes on across the street, how to take those complex kids to you guys. Um, so we actually have a new program that's in place. So if you'd like to take an elective, you're more than welcome. This is just an example of our learning modules and then a sample of the um, schedule that I piloted in November. So we have rotations with our pediatric pulmonologist at Hotai, which is home of the innocents down the street. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but we do a lot of work with them and our medically complex kids who are unsafe to go home just due to their medical problems, as well as with our hemoc clinics, our hemophilia survivorship, um, and then a lot of rotations with our Lee Specialty Clinic as well, just to kind of get an understanding of what's both in your community downtown with our hospitals, but also a little bit more locally. And so these are my resources. Thank you, guys. Any questions? Any thoughts? All right, thank you.